All right. Thank you, everyone, <clears throat> for joining us for the webinar, Slow and Say Hello, a program to reduce trail conflicts and protect resources. My name is Candace Gallagher, and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 160th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. Uh, this free webinar is being recorded. It includes real-time closed captioning in English and also offers free learning credits. Uh, links for both the closed captioning and the learning credit quiz will be in the chat box if you don't already see them there. And attendees will receive a follow-up email from me with the recording, the transcripts, uh, and the resources slide with the presenter's emails, um, as well as learning credit details within two days following the webinar. And we are saving time for attendee questions at the end of the webinar, uh, but we do welcome you to send your questions at any time throughout the presentation via the Q&A icon that you'll see. Um, it should be at the bottom of your screen. And a thank you to our webinar partners that include the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, the Federal Highway Administration, as well as the National Park Service. And I'm excited uh, to introduce today's webinar presenters. We have Kurt Kruger, who is the co-founder and current director of Trail Partners. And we have Tom Boss, who is the off-road and events director with uh, Marin County Bicycle Coalition. So I will now have Kurt take control to start uh, today's presentation. Thank you, Candace. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm Kurt Kruger, the president of the Trail Partners Foundation. Uh, and with me is Tom Boss, uh, the off-road director for the Marin County Bicycle Coalition. We're here today to bring you the next chapter in our safety and resource protection program, which we introduced eight years ago on the trails of Mount Tamalpais near San Francisco. Since then, Slow and Say Hello, as we call it, has had great success in reducing conflicts on our Bay Area trails. And we are now actively pursuing the expansion of this program to other states and Canada. We'll start with a three minute video to introduce you to the program. The biggest change I've seen is a lot more, a lot more use generally across the discipline. And, and, with, and the advent of bikes out on the trails and fire roads. Uh, my name is John. McCall. Hey, Kurt, I'm not seeing a video. I hear it, but I don't see it. And I'm here representing you. Okay, let me see if I can. My name is Suzanne Gooch, and I'm here, we go. Out here representing the equestrian community. I'm Katie Rice. I'm the Marin County Supervisor. I represent the Ross Valley, and I'm also... So a Marin County and it, up in Mill Valley and have hiked and ridden horses and biked and taken my dog all over the trails and fire roads of this great open space for the last half century. Well, I think it's a great campaign to bring awareness to the challenges we have of shared use on the trails. And the Slow to Say Hello campaign is great because it reinforces this idea that you have to be able to slow down enough to be able to say hello to somebody as you pass by. And it's amazing when they when the kids do that, it really diffuses things on the trail. I want to say about a few years ago, our bike community, our hiking community, our equestrian community, members of those communities that really saw the need to raise the bar in terms of how we interact out on the trails and came up with this collaborative idea brought it to the County of Marin and the Marin County um, Marin Parks and Open Space to, um, you know, get behind a campaign that's about building courtesy and community out on the trails. I've been a part of Slow and Say Hello as um, a representative of the Water District uh, as part of the public outreach. It's been fantastic. I think uh, it's been great to see not only the agencies and the user groups working together, but more important than that is it really is helpful to the public. and. Um, helping to see the, you know, the message get out to the public. And I've seen it, uh, I've seen it firsthand in a lot of these busy areas where we see a more higher traffic, uh, especially Phoenix Lake, Lake Lagunitas, but we've seen an improvement with relations between different user groups on the mountain. Really stunning how much the hiking and biking community appreciated 
getting to understand uh, horses and equestrians out on the trails. I actually did not know that horses didn't perceive riders the same way that they perceived pedestrians or, or hikers. So it was a real thing to learn. And ever since then, I've gone out of my way to stop and get off my bike whenever I encounter an equestrian and you know, talk to them. Or at least, you know, if, if I'm riding up slowly to them, I, I talk to them first uh, before the horses get skittish and ask the riders if it's okay to ride by. I can feel it out there, and I've been walking these hills and trails for decades. So I think the video speaks volumes. I hope you can all hear it. Sometimes it doesn't work as well over the internet. <clears throat> so what do people say about trails in your area? For some of you, they likely say conflicts are rare. But for many others, conflicts are increasing and it's a concern. Uh, is crowding a problem? Well, and then COVID hit. COVID brought more people outdoors. It, it brought a cohort of people to our trails who hadn't been there previously. So more people, less knowledge and understanding about safety and about the environment. What can you as land managers or simply trail users do? Well, my suggestion is don't reinvent the wheel. I invite you to learn from our experience. We've had almost a decade of study and ongoing improvement. We've hosted education outposts all across California on a variety of different trail types with different land managers, uh, different types of uses. We've also held public events like county fairs and so forth, and then presented to a wide range of private groups. And the entire time we've learned what works and what doesn't, and we've adapted. So what are the takeaways? Trail conflict has two main causes, more people and speed. The biggest trigger for the safety issue is more people. Then you get more people, tensions can grow, and conflict results. So what's been the response? Well, uh, many of you have seen the, some of these in different places. Um, some call for making everything multi-use. Others want to ban bikes. You've got enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. Don't, don't do anything unless you have enough rangers for enforcement. And more recently, we've seen people promoting something like be nice, use proper etiquette. And many of our areas, they keep trying these same things and they don't work. What did Einstein say about doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result? That's right, insanity. So we want to develop a program that works. How do you do that? Like any venture, you and your team, if there's a number of you, must first understand the issue. Uh, land managers must accept that trail conflict runs counter to their mission. Land managers were brought on board to, to manage land, to build trails, and to create a good environment. Conflict resolution is not in their wheelhouse. Second, you must know what user groups use your trails. And this is important. You should assess what stage of conflict exists on your trail network. Different strategies apply depending on your stage of conflict. And finally, your education program should be guided by an understanding of how people accept information, how they learn. I'll explain each of these points. Conflict on the trail runs counter to the mission of land managers. It creates hostility. It can ruin one's enjoyment of the outdoors, and it can make people fearful, all of which results in displacement. We may hear from angry equestrians or even hear of accidents, but displacement flies under the radar. And displacement occurs among all user groups uh, and especially um, some of the less mobile ones. Accidents do occur and some are serious, but they're rare and most are never even reported. 
Uh, and once conflict angers trail users, and we've seen this across a number of places, there's a loss of respect for others, for authority, and for the environment. Target audience. Knowing your target user groups is important to customizing your messaging and enlisting partner organizations. Stages of trail conflict. Over time, uses, usage on your trails will increase. Experience shows that more people leads to more conflict. So the sooner you begin the education process, the better you are ultimately. All our experience points to education as the key to improving safety and resource protection. But how do people learn? Is it the same for everyone? How do you reach people? Who will people most, are most likely to listen to? Rangers have stature and many people respect them. What about local clubs or user groups, friends, family? Our research, research shows that local bike, horse, or another user group is the most effective way to do it. And of course, support from the Rangers reinforces that message, but it mostly has to come from the user groups themselves. So moving forward to be successful, we've found that all user groups must support the program and land managers must be on board too. How do you get that broad support? I know of three approaches that have worked. There may be others. In the case of our program, it resulted from an accident and the huge public outcry that followed. Another approach is to bring mountain bike groups on board by making access to trails contingent upon active support of the safety program. And I said mountain bike groups here, but I'm talking about all groups becoming part of the program. An example of this uh, is a, a, a trail change of use process that is going on uh, in Folsom area outside of Sacramento. The citizen study group recommended a change of use from hiker equestrian to multi-use uh, during a one-year trial period. They also insisted that there be a safety program established and that all user groups support it. At the end of the one year, then the decision would be made on a permanent designation. So that approach, which was orchestrated by the land managers, brings the group to get groups together. The best approach, in my opinion, is for national organizations to promote a nationwide safety program. Leave No Trace is an example of an effective nationwide program. So where do you start? You first need to identify and then recruit partners from the major user groups. You need to assemble a coalition. In our case, Tom Boss and I, excuse me, uh, Tom Boss and I representing mountain bikes and equestrians were ready to work together, but we realized we needed representation for hikers. We agreed to approach the Marin Conservation League and boy, was that the right decision. Nona Dennis, the MCL president, uh, became the force for environmental preservation that complements the safety program. A word of caution at this point, the groups necessary to form a successful collaboration will likely have a history of opposing each other on many fronts. To get past that, there should be a clear understanding that the collaboration exists for the narrow purposes we've defined as safety and resource protection. On other issues, the groups will, groups will continue to act independently. I strongly recommend a written agreement, such as a memo of understanding or MOU. The MOU we developed is four pages long. Yours doesn't have to be that extensive, but we had years of issues behind all this. The MOU serves several purposes. It narrowly defined our scope safety and resource protection. It set clear boundaries for what we could say on behalf of trail partners, our group. Each of our three groups had members who were convinced all of this was a scam perpetrated by the other groups. They felt we were sleeping with the enemy. The MOU helped to diffuse that feeling. The core messages of the Slow and Say Hello program, we believe to be universal. However, 
every area is unique. The literature, PowerPoints, trail quiz, all of those things should be adapted to the local conditions. The Slow and Say Hello logo is trademark protected and that should not change. However, the logos of the partner groups should be replaced along with those of the supporting land managers and funding sources. And finally, it takes funds to promote the message. We found seed money relatively easy to find. Uh, county supervisors, park foundations, vendors, civic organizations, community organizations. They all supported this effort. And my advice to any of you that may be considering an approach similar to what we have done in Marin County, take the time to do it right, establish trust among diverse users, develop a message that resonates. It took us two full years of weekly meetings among ourselves, along with presentations of our concepts to others to refine our message. And then once we launched our program, we continued to learn and improve. So almost a decade ago, the three groups that began this collaboration have made a significant difference for safety and resource protection in our county. The Trail Partners Foundation exists today to help others achieve a similar success. We've learned much over the past decade, and we want to share that knowledge and experience. So I'm going to talk now about how the Slow and Salo program really got started and evolved into the success it is today. In the early 70s, that's right, 50 years ago, mountain bikes appeared on a local mountain, Mount Tamalpais. In this photo here are some of the original founders of the whole mountain bike uh, era. Otis Guy, Joe Breeze, Gary Fisher, they were among the pioneers in the sport. Initially, the issues were minor, as all users enjoyed the outdoors. However, as more people crowded onto the same trails, conflicts grew. Land managers responded by limiting access for mountain bikes to some of the trails. This worsened the animosity among the various user groups. And over the course of several decades, the hostility among user groups was severe. Then a tragedy occurred. A woman, Lisa, was thrown off her horse after two mountain bikers sped toward her around a blind corner. Lisa landed hard and broke several vertebrae. She was evacuated by helicopter, spent weeks in the hospital, and lost a full year of work. Kurt? Yes? It sounds like there's an alarm going off in the background. It's distracting some people. Um, I'm not sure if that's on your end. It was. It's oh. no longer there. All right. Thanks. So back to Lisa in the hospital. Uh, this really hit the community hard. It changed everything. There was a lot of press and a lot of talk. Who's to blame? The kids involved were never identified, but cooler heads prevailed. Let's try a new approach. It started with an op-ed by Tom Boss of the Marin County Bicycle Coalition and me with the Horse Council. We can work together for trail safety. But that wasn't enough. We recognized that simply putting in an editorial, uh, putting some signs out, all of that would pass and things would go back to the way they were. So we uh, arranged for the three groups that I mentioned earlier to come together, the Bicycle Coalition, the Horse Council, and the Marin Conservation League. And although those three organizations had fought with each other for years, we agreed to work together and speak with one voice on two goals, trail safety and resource protection. I wanna take just a second at this point to emphasize the importance of the resource component of our program. The amount of land and nature will never grow. It's a fixed resource. However, the number of visitors to that land does grow. We have a responsibility to protect our lands and its creatures, not just for us and our children, but for their children and generations to come. Now I'd like to introduce Tom Boss, the co-founder of Trail Partners and the off-road director of the Marin County Bicycle Coalition. Tom? Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Um, beyond these two main goals, we still represented different cultures. 
different recreational experiences. We needed to shift from focusing on our differences to understanding what we share as we recreate, how to accommodate differences, make them work together. Most important, how could we educate others and change behaviors to reflect this recognition? Since there is no one pattern of interaction between trail users, no one size fits all, we would need to consider a broad array of situations and figure out a simple way to improve all kinds of interactions. On our local public lands, whether you're on foot, horseback or bicycle, you generally don't know when you're crossing from one park jurisdiction to another. In, in Marin, in any, in any case, we have uh, more than four different agencies, national park, state park, regional parks, and a watershed that's open to the public. Trail conflict uh, can happen in all jurisdictions, so the rangers who care for these lands all have the same problem. How do you educate and engage with visitors, and how do you enforce rules? Rangers that may not be consistent. Rangers have limited resources. They can't be everywhere. We talked to them and got their enthusiastic support. They agreed, however, that the key would be to somehow change behavior. All this sounds good, but is it possible? To achieve what we're trying to do requires a change in attitudes and a change in behavior. Changing behavior is hard. Those who struggle with trail issues for years have lots of reasons why this approach will never work. People are bombarded with messages in, uh, encouraging bad behavior uh, and, and uh, campaigns often uh, enforce speed and adrenaline. We, uh, they never change. Uh, too many people feel entitled. Uh, they do what they want to. Okay, we know what we're trying to achieve, safety and resource protection, but how do we change behavior? Just telling people what to do doesn't work. Let me say that again. Just telling people what to do doesn't work. You need to provide the why and be more thorough in your explanations. Uh, can behavior patterns be changed? A generation ago, Candy Littner, uh, her daughter was killed by a drunk driver. She was told, you'll never change anything. It's impossible. The alcohol industry is too powerful. She started a movement that changed the way Americans regard drinking and driving. Mothers against drunk driving. Texans don't like to be told what to do. Yet when they started telling each other, Behavior changed, started in 1985 by the Texas Department of Transportation. From the beginning, Don't Mess With Texas has been a great success, using iconic Texas celebrities to help spread the message, including Willie Nelson and George Strait, athletes like George Foreman and Randy White. Many other TV ads have been uh, released in Spanish as well as English. Uh, they have lots of corporate non-sponsor partners. The thing that's interesting about this movement in contrast to others, which started in the 1980s, is that it's been a grassroots social media campaign. It's not been waged on traditional media outlets, but instead on YouTube, Facebook, and through a myri myriad of local organizations such as Saved the Bay to the Surf Rider Foundation. It's all, and, and we're talking now about the plastic um, ban on plastic bags. It's also a worldwide campaign from Rwanda to Europe to China. And it's an issue that's been tackled by on the city level first. I think it illustrates the current trend towards dealing with pressing issues on, lo on a local level and, and want, uh, and waiting for them to trickle up to the state and national level. I think the plastic bag campaign is the one for the trail partners to watch, though we can certainly draw from Don't Mess With Texas for inspiration from this fun and snappy style and its emphasis on local pride. There may be some stuff to draw from on MAD as well, 
since Trail Partners is dealing with public safety issues and MAD uh, tugs at the heartstrings in many ways. Understanding how to change behavior, uh, credit to the EPA for this slide. People generally fit into three groups regarding their response to behavior change, shown here as show me, help me, make me. A target of our message on the largest group of people, the help me, uh, we target, excuse me, uh, our message on the largest group, the help me, that group respond, um, will respond if they understand the reasons. Do not target the make me group, isolate them. We discussed ex existing behaviors and in what way these behaviors were either unsafe or harmful to habitat. We coupled that with desired behaviors. It took us almost a year of weekly meetings before two things happened. We developed the trust with one another, and we realized that each of us did not understand the safety needs of the other groups. So our first key finding, user groups don't know the safety needs of other groups. Uh, physical accidents between trail users are rare, thank goodness. However, a fast moving user on a bike may feel a trail conflict occurs only when there is an accident. Uh, when in fact, simply being startled by a fast moving trail user may diminish the experience of the other uh, that the other was seeking, that of calm and solitude, for example. This may result in bad will and a lack of trust towards one group and may cause an individual to stop visiting an area uh, out of concern for safety. We developed the slogan, put yourself in my shoes. We use this to develop targeted messages for each user group. A key finding, hikers routinely say hello and talk to one another when they pass. This humanizes the encounter with others and fosters communication. Key finding two, promoting active two-way communication between trail users is a single most important factor in creating safe encounters on the trails. Another key finding is that uh, is really important. It's our key finding three. Once hostility exists among users, then education is only possible from members within the same group. Key finding four, individuals on, trail, uh, individuals on the trail should establish between themselves what is safe based on the terrain, the circumstance of their meeting, and whatever other factors are present. At the moment, at that place, and at that time, the yield signs aren't always observed or seen. We prefer active communication uh, to establish safe trails. For example, these bikes move off the trail to allow the horses to pass. However, sometimes it's safer for the horse to stop and let the bike riders pass. It depends on the terrain, the number of riders and the sight lines. The riders should make that call rather than trying to follow preset rules. Sometimes there are no rules for who should do what. Uh, some horses can spook at unexpected shapes or movement. In this photo, the Peruvian woman and the horse are used to seeing each other. However, many horses in California may be startled by a large hat or a scary backpack. The rider should ask the hiker to talk to her horse, uh, and that may diminish, uh, and, and, that, and, and may even dismount and lead the horse to safety. Uh, back, uh, backpack before proceeding, or the scary backpack before proceeding. Uh, and another thing we like to point out is the voice. Uh, a horse is, is very familiar with the human voice. So we encourage all of, our, um, all of our trail users to use the voice, speak friendly, loudly, whenever you encounter a horse, and that's likely to um, make the horse feel more comfortable. Uh, another example about communication, a jogger comes up on a hiker, Jogger hears on your right, hiker moves to the right. 
We found that 50% of hikers don't know what on your right means. A result could be a collision. Yelling instructions is not communicating. Communicating means a two-way exchange. It doesn't have to be words. It could be a nod or a wave or a smile, but it does have to be two-way. Our slogan, slow and, slay, slow and Say Hello, promotes communication between trail users. That's the single most important step in creating safe trail encounters. It also leads users to determine what is safe at the moment and at that place on the trail. Uh, these signs are everywhere. Here's one to make those signs and your trails safer. We developed a trifold flyer. Each panel, uh, hiker, horse, and bike, was written by uh, each user group with specific uh, actions related to their activity. The back of the panel carries the logos of the five area land managers who support our program. And the left hand panel is about wildlife. We are visitors of the outdoors for a short time, but the wildlife and the flora live there. It is their home that we are visiting and we have a moral obligation to preserve and protect all of it. And again, this goes back to how we uh, were able to collaborate by focusing on resource protection. Everybody wants to protect these places for future generations and of course, a safe experience on the trails. So we created, uh, we had these flyers and we created a spreadsheet of recreational gathering places, including visitor centers, trailhead kiosks, bike and horse and recreation shops, local motels and hotels and other establishments that cater to park visitors. And we set out distributing these flyers or the, yeah, these trifolds around the county. Each land manager also received the brochures and distributed them to their staff and volunteers. We couldn't do any of this without the support of our land managers. They have embraced trail partners. They love to see various stakeholders working together on shared interests and to see the value of the message coming from community stakeholders rather than the rangers or other park staff. By the way, the gentleman in the middle of the chair, uh, the middle uh, of this photo was the chair of the water district when we started. He's now the um, director of state parks in California. That's Armando Quintero in the middle there. Initially, we got donations of 500 to 1,000. Once the land managers saw we had a viable program, they each committed up to $5,000 annually. Um, we received additional funds from community grants, nonprofits, Point Reyes National Seashore, Bay Area Barns and Trails, uh, Friends of China Camp. We also uh, got help on marketing from companies like Cliff Bar and REI. And those funds, we're completely a completely a volunteer organization. Those funds are to purchase our um, prize gifts, our, our branded tents and tables, and, and, uh, and to create content like the video you saw earlier. Um, we began hosting informational outposts at Trailheads, always manned by three user groups. We always had to have, we always have a hiker, a mountain biker, and equestrian present, and we also encourage rangers uh, to participate as well or, or uh, interpretive um, staff. We, we've approached people to try and talk about trail safety. 90% told us they already knew about safety or they were in a hurry. Um, we needed a new approach. We came up with a trail quiz. Uh, we'd say, how would you like to take a short quiz? And for doing so, you'll, you'll walk away with a prize. I should also mention that the horse, uh, we, having a horse there uh, also draws uh, especially families in. Uh, now we were getting the engagement we wanted. Uh, people were drawn into our tent. Uh, they saw the nice prizes that we had out there, such as socks, hats, uh, branded handkerchiefs, things like that, uh, little tote bags. And to get them, we just asked a series of questions. And I'll give you a few examples now. Uh, you are approaching a horse and a rider while riding on a bike on a trail. Which side should you pass? I will give the answer. <laughs> um, 
Well, I'll get, I'll, uh, in that case, that's a, a question designed to kind of uh, create a conversation. You might say on the uphill, downhill, right or left. What we say is the best thing to do is communicate with the rider and ask them what they would like. Another example of a question is when you encounter a puddle completely across the width of a trail, should you go around it or through it? This one, generally people say, oh, I go around it. And we point out by doing so, you're just widening the footprint of the trail, potentially tramping, uh, trampling vegetation. So the best thing to do is try and go over or through it to, not, to lessen your footprint. Another component of the program was uh, the development of, uh, of uh, Tails and Tires, clever name for a uh, workshop where we bring cyclists and equestrians together um, to learn about their needs and how to interact around each other. It has since become popular in a variety uh, of trail user groups. And while we uh, get horses, uh, we get the, the, the cyclists on horses, which is sometimes a first time experience and they understand the, how tricky it can be to maneuver a, a live animal. Um, also, we invite equestrians to these events so that their horses can feel more comfortable around bicyclists. Uh, we start the 30 minute talk about horse psychology, including the predator prey concepts and what makes a horse spook. We also ask, why, uh, we ask them why we have public trails instead of more houses and pavement. In our community, we actually bonded together to protect a lot of lands, not only to stop development, but to make sure that we have plenty of natural places uh, to recreate as well as for our wildlife to, uh, to, to thrive. Many of them had never thought about that. Here's a short video. Primarily to teach mountain bikers, and right now we're focused on the mountain bike racing teams to teach them how to safely interact with horses on the trails. Horses don't recognize mountain bikes as a person on a bicycle. They see it as something unknown and they run from it. So we're teaching safe ways to interact with the riders. Hey, thank you. We were trained of how to go on the, to a horse, and the big thing was talking to them, talking to the rider, and just talking in general, because that helps soothe the horse, that helps get the whole situation calmed down. We did uh, some fun exercises. We rode on horses, and it was amazing. It was really fun, but it was scary, too. I thought all the people here riding the mountain bikes were very open to learning about like how to manage stuff with horses and how to deal with them on trails. So I thought that was very good. And I feel like if um, this can expand to the like whole county, then definitely a lot of more mountain bikers will know how to act around a horse. So I won't be that nervous anymore going on a trail or encountering a mountain biker. I think this type of event, this Tails and Tires event, um, where horses and bikes can work together to create an enjoyable trail experience um, is really useful. People should definitely take advantage of it well, Tails and Tires, I think, is both an educational opportunity, but it's a very fun way uh, not only to learn uh, how to respond out on the trails and interact with your fellow trail user, um, but you're also uh, getting to know your, your fellow trail users. Yeah. 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 Pretty good. You get up there all by yourself? Yeah. Kind of long for you. We've conducted Tails and Tires in three Northern California counties. Um, and a number of parks in our own Marin County. Almost anyone can conduct these sessions. We have training materials complete with scripts for the instructors. All of these materials were developed and all of the experiences we've learned, um, all of the materials we've developed and all of the experience we've learned is available to any person or group that agrees to use it in a positive educational-based program dedicated to local trail users. This, by the way, answers one, I think the first question that came in. Yes, we're, we're intending to share our materials and our branding. Slow and Say Hello is already incorporated in safety programs in other states and the Ministry of Parks in Alberta, Canada. Thank you for your attention. We have some time for questions now or stop by our, oh, <laughs> or, uh, or visit the links <laughs> that have been provided for you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you so much, Kurt. Um, I had mentioned again, um, you know, in the chat that those uh, links to both of those videos that you saw, they will be available in the resources slide. So you can view those, you know, share with others um, in case you were having connectivity issues, you know, in case it was a little choppy for you, which we understand that that does happen, um, depending on your internet connection. So, um, Tom, I know that you had answered uh, that first question that kind of came in from Jill in regards to other organizations and agencies using the phrase, you know, slow and say hello, um, and just regarding the copyright rules. Is that available for them now? Because I know you guys are still, um, are you still in the process or what? Just yeah, we're, we're, we're very close to, to rolling that out. And we've already, uh, commun you know, we've already worked with uh, some groups on a one, one on one basis. Um, you know, there, there are just a handful of uh, conditions that we, we encourage in order to then we'll release our, our message and our, um, our uh, trademarked uh, brand and our assets to other communities. We generally want to make sure that we have at least two, if not three different user groups working together. Obviously, it needs to be supported by the local land managers and things like that. And then the spirit of the campaign, we want to make sure that people aren't um, using it for their, for their own uh, particular purpose that may not... Um, you know, be so a, if the, um, if if anyone is interested, they can send me an email, and I will respond uh, with a short agreement we ask you to sign, which basically you're agreeing to use it as we said in a positive education-based program, um, and then I will put you in touch with our graphic designer, Renee Harcourt. Uh, she has done all of our graphic works, and she can either provide simply the logos or uh, she could customize some of what we have for your specific area, um, whatever you prefer. But um, uh, I'm not a graphics person, so we'll put the two of you together and, and uh, make it work that way. That's great. Thank you so much. And so again, I know you both are located in California, but this this uh, program can go far far beyond California and other other areas across the country. So. Great, thank you so much. Um, I know uh, Tom and Kurt, I had talked to you about a question that kind of came in earlier um, during registration um, from Karen, just in regards to their equestrian um, plan that they have, the trails, um, trails Safe Passing Plan, and they're out of Colorado. And so there, you, Kurt, you kind of explained that there are other programs that are out there. I would love for you just kind of to, to add on to that, because I'm sure there's probably other people on the on the webinar as well that may have that same question. Yeah, so um, our our program has evolved quite a bit since its start um, nine years ago, and uh, as we went to the public, we learned things and we we evolved, we changed, we got better, we got feedback, that sort of thing, and much of the programs that I've seen are where we were a few years back. Uh, they're all positive, they're in the right direction, but um, we have components to our program um, that I haven't seen uh, in other places as well. So uh, we're hoping to shortcut the, the timeline it takes for people to have a fully comprehensive program. Um, so that's the purpose of the Trail Partners Foundation. Uh, we're gonna be developing a starter kit and uh, in, I think the most difficult part is getting the various user groups to recognize the need to work together or the benefits from it. Uh, so if it starts as a, simply a land manager rolling out a program, that's fine. But uh, ultimately, the most effective thing is when the various user groups agree to work together in a collaboration. Great. Um, Lou has a question. Um... Uh, and I know this came in when Tom was talking during his presentation. Since you indicated that verbal trail user communication should be on um, a one-on-one -on -one basis, should the yield signs be removed? I, I, I think it's helpful to have a number of different um, uh, messages deployed, whether it's our outposts or just friendly interactions that we're promoting. But some people do read signs, and I think um, I think they're still relevant. Um, but I think there's no one size fits all, as we mentioned. So I would keep the signs, but don't rely solely on them. 
I would like to see those signs modified. In, in our presentation, we showed one possible way. The yield signs serve several useful purposes. One is that it, it helps instill an understanding that you're not alone. There's other users out there who require uh, your, your consideration. Um, the thing that is, uh, that is a negative about the yield signs is that it creates an impression that if I follow the, the arrows on the yield sign, everything will be okay. And the yield signs don't always work. They don't address sight lines. Um, they don't take into account that users can talk to each other. So it's a judgment call. Um, Tyler has a question just um, in regards, kind of a follow up, you know, uh, expanding be beyond Marin County um, and NorCal in California. Uh, you know, he's based out of uh, Salt Lake City, although he is a Marin native, he said. Um, but just in regards to the website that you guys currently have, I know that it goes to Safe Trails Marin, I believe, right now, but I do know that you have the foundation's website, which is still kind of evolving. Um, just kind of not confusing people about going to a California or a California County website. Um, how will that work in the future? I guess will, will it be the trailpartners.net? Yes. The trail okay. partners foundation is the entity that was created. It's a 501 C three to work with expansion of this program uh, to other areas throughout the country. Well, throughout North America, uh, the, Safe Trails Marin is the website that was deals with the program in Marin County. And we have evolved uh, or, or split off uh, the foundation from the Marin County part so as not to distract uh, those involved in the Marin program from what happens in the rest of the country. Um, uh, Karen has a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I see a question Thank about off leash <laughs> dogs. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in our county, we did have issues with especially dog walkers, people who would have, uh, you know, numerous dogs all on leash, but they would kind of form a bubble around the hiker that uh, made it difficult for other users on the trail. We determined it was not enough of a problem to change the focus of our three main user groups. Um, uh, one of the things we recognize that in other areas, you have to customize what you're doing to what you have there on the ground. For example, we don't have any OHV areas uh, in Marin County. Uh, I'm living now uh, in the foothills of California and we do have OHV, so they definitely have to be part of uh, uh, any program that's, that's put together. Um, yeah. I would add to that that one of the challenges in our county is, again, we have four, four to five different land managers and each has slightly different uh, rules on dogs. Some are allowed on leash, some are allowed off leash, some in certain areas. We even have uh, popular trails that go back and forth between two land managers where in theory, you're supposed to have them on leash in and, and, and one part and, on, and not on the other. So um, that said, we, it is one of the questions uh, we do. We do generally ask at the quiz, there's a question around whether or not the dog is required on a leash. And we ask, do you know why that is? And generally it's because of the, we want to protect the wildlife is the main reason for, um, for do dog uh, uh, rules. One of the, there was a question about our trail quiz. Um, we have mm -hmm. uh, several pages of questions, and we uh, did some uh, outposts up in the Lake Tahoe area. So we were up in the mountains, and, and the trail quiz up there is different. Uh, for example, one of the concerns about having a dog off leash in the mountains in October is it's rut season, and a dog off leash could likely be attacked by a buck if it got near a doe. Um, those are things that people don't often think about. Um, there was also a question about if you have only hikers and what about uh, getting hikers to stay on the trail for environmental concerns. I'm going to use an example that came up during our initial meetings. Uh, the director of the county parks was a former uh, chief ranger in Yosemite. And she said that they had a meadow where there were birds nesting. So they put out signs that said, no parking, no picnicking. 
and everybody ignored them. They then a couple weeks later came back and added the words birds nesting to those same signs. And all of a sudden, everybody paid attention to it. So, um, and this goes back to what we found in our, our bell curve. Um, most people will do the right thing if they understand the reasons behind it. So if you have hikers who are going off trail, my suggestion is signage or a program to educate why that's a bad thing. Um, we talk about in the trail quiz questions, the, the bad effects of invasive species and everyone answers well, it crowds out the native species. Well, the animals in the area have evolved to live off of the native species. So when the invasives crowd out the natives, it affects the animals in the area as well. It's a whole food chain thing. So there's lots of education that can take place to help people stay on the trails. Yeah, and we, we definitely put, put that message out that it's best to stay on the trails. And for horses and bikes, actually, in our community, you're required to stay on the trails. But if you're on foot, you you can wander off. But even then, we we encourage people to, to try and stay on the designated trails, not only for the resource values, but also cultural values. Uh, in Marin, a lot of our public lands are on the ancestral territory of the of the coastal Miwok, and they they also encourage people to stay on the designated routes, and we remind people of that is one of the many reasons to do so. There's a question about if uh, if you have if there's a fee for our services, and the answer is no. Uh, our services, our foundation, uh, is free of charge. Um, the money that we collect through the foundation is used for things like uh, website expenses, but uh, having the outposts, having the table with the banners and the pop-up with the signage and, and the little bit of swag that we use to entice people in, uh, that's what we raise money for. Uh, now that said, uh, we can envision a time when there may be some travel by uh, Tom or I to uh, do some in-person seminars, weekend workshops, something like that. Uh, and we would ask for travel expenses, but uh, other than that, no, the services are free. Okay. Um, Tyler has a question. If you have seen uh, any examples where land managers have taken this on without formal trail user coalition partnerships, he just says that they don't have significant organized trail user groups yet. We have an organization in uh, Northern New Mexico that has just um, agreed, signed our, our memo and is, is rolling out a program. Um, the same thing with the, the uh, up in Alberta, Canada. Um, they're just adopting the signage and the concept part of the program. Um, we recognize that establishing the coalition is probably the most difficult part of replicating what we have done. Um, but the more exposure we have for the slow and say hello, uh, message, uh, just like the Leave No Trace started kind of small, but it's now uh, recognized nationally. The more we get the information out there, the better it will be. Um, it also, it takes time and kind of one-on-one -on -one discussions for the various user groups uh, to recognize that it's in their long-term interest to work together when there are shared interests. Um, most uh, of the varying user groups tend to think, as I said in the presentation, um, you know, why would we work with them? They're the enemy. And uh, ultimately, you figure out that there's more shared interests than there are differences, and uh, everybody's here to stay. So uh, it's better if we work together. Um, a question came in from Tracy, who's on Facebook, um, watching the Facebook Live. You had mentioned um, that etiquette campaigns, you know, mainly clever trail signs, had been tried, and I and she's seen that here in Georgia. Um, what would you say were the shortcomings of that? Um, most people don't understand the safety needs of other user groups. So most people think they're being nice. They think they're being safe. They think they're, uh, if you notice in our presentation, we did not use the word etiquette. Um, to me, etiquette is more about 
uh, polite ways to for people in society to interact with each other. Our program is about safety. It's about not being afraid to be on the trail. It's about lack of injury. And uh, most people don't understand what how what they're doing can be unsafe for others. So it's an education process. Yeah, I, I would say, though, that um, I think, you know, like the triangle that's out there, it's been there for decades that might people might get blind to that over time. But I do think that deploying like uh, new flashy fun messages, we do like a Burma shave style messaging sometimes when the new trail comes online. And if it's a temporary deployment um, and with some clever language, I think those uh, those do um, help. One of our uh, small reservoirs in the water district lands and the water district lands are recreational uh, facilities um, had about a mile loop trail around the reservoir and the person in charge of things for the water district asked us to set up a safety zone where feeder trails came into this loop so we put up our um, our pop-up with our table with our three different groups um, and we had the Burma shave type sandwich board signs as people approached it, you know, safety zone ahead, safety zone, learn learn what to do. And then we have a bike and horse ride together around that loop as well. Um, the person in charge of it with the water district uh, came to one of our presentations a year later and he said that he used to get all kinds of complaints about issues at that reservoir. And in the past year after our safety zone, he had no complaints. Um, I found that hard to believe, but uh, it definitely made an impact that made a believer out of him for sure. Um, Michael is asking, do your efforts currently address any issues around diversity or recreation equity? We don't take that on ourselves, um, but we definitely, I, you know, we're seeing more um, people out in the parks, especially since the pandemic and we're, and we're seeing um, that being addressed, it appears. Um, but our parks uh, do a number of things to um, to address those, including there's a, you can get free park passes if that's a hurdle. The cost of uh, admission to the parks. You go to your local library and you get a, a, a free park pass to any park. And improvements in transportation are key, uh, providing transit um, from all of our communities into the parks. Um, but yeah, but we don't address it ourselves in this program. Um, Nancy is uh, mentioning that they are finding the electric bike and one wheeler users uh, are a relatively new trail users um, without benefit of education from an association. Do you guys have any success reaching out to this new user group? Um, our group, uh, Trail Partners, um, has not taken a position on e bikes. Um, we believe that the issues that e-bikes present are no different than the issues that other um, bikes or, or other types of users present. So we have not specifically addressed it. Um, we also do not specifically address uh, if one group wants access to a trail they don't have or wants a new trail or wants changes of that sort of thing. That's outside the scope of safety and resource protection. So we're, we're very, um, clear about, you know, uh, the positions that we take, the things that we say when we're wearing the trail partner's hat. Yeah, that, but I did want to address, uh, I was going to call that out. There was a question about separating use or different, different strategies. And again, that is uh, something that we don't talk about in this uh, format. Uh, we might have conversations outside of trail partners about different trail, um, uh, alternatives, but I do think that, you know, really, if you have uh, a lot of different users, I look at a number, you know, I think you have to look at all the different options. I think it's really important to have places where we all have to get to get along and share trails, but but I think in some cases, uh, separating use through uh, alternate trails or different times of day, um, I think all of these kind of ideas should be considered uh, as, as more and more people head out to our parks. Great. We'll do one more question. I know we're, we're at the end time. Let's do one more question from Elizabeth. Um, have you ever seen this program take route on a long distance trail that has varying user groups 
um, based on the trail section. And she mentioned horses and or snowmobiles, you know, only permitted in certain sections. Um, I live uh, just a, a short distance from the Tevis Trail. The Tevis Trail is a hundred mile uh, endurance. Uh, it was started as a horse endurance race from Lake Tahoe to Auburn, 100 miles in one day, 24 hours. Uh, it's now also the site of runners on that same thing. And uh, there are different sections that have different uses and different safety programs. So uh, there is nothing that covers the entire trail. Uh, it's all very localized. I, I would just add that what, what we do in Marin County, we find, uh, we deploy our outposts in areas where we know we're gonna get a really good mix of people and a lot of uh, engagement with hikers, equestrians, and we're not gonna go to an area where there's just horses or just bikes. We do our best to try and find those places where, where we're most likely to engage with all different trail users. Great. Okay, well, a thank you again uh, to Tom and to Kurt. Really appreciate your time. We do have many more comments and questions that have come in in regards to this, um, but we'll not be able to address them due to time constraints. But I will be working with the presenters following this webinar to answer any of those unanswered questions and share that as a resource with attendees um, in another email, as well as on the webinar's webpage um, as soon as that is available. You are wel uh, welcome to reach out to the presenters yourself if we would like a quicker answer. And of course, if you are interested um, in participating in this program um, or if you have more questions. Um, and then this uh, resources slide is what I will share with attendees. Um, and I do already have the video for Tails and Tires. I just have not added it to this slide yet, but it will be in the email um, and I share it with attendees um, within two days. So uh, thank you again to the presenters. Thank you again to our other additional partners that include the Bureau of Land Management, the US Forest Service, the Federal Highway Administration, as well as the National Park Service. And if you are enjoying our webinars, please consider donating as little as $5 uh, by texting I'm for Trails to 44321. Your donation will go to the Trail Fund, um, a new grant program of American Trails. Um, but the deadline for our 2022 inaugural um, application process that has already passed, we've already selected the winners for this year, but we are um, working hard for 2023 funding um, currently. Um, so anyone that does donate immediately following this webinar will receive, um, or not anyone, I'm sorry, I will select a couple people to uh, receive uh, our Trail Boss mug as a thank you. And uh, lastly, we hope you'll be able to join us for uh, this upcoming webinar that we have taking place next week. Uh, it's free and you can register for it today. So thank you again to everyone for attending. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and happy trails.